you look like. Mm -hmm. Paul comes to us with a huge background, far more than his simple plumber status. I cannot possibly cover everything in this introduction, so here's a sketch of his achievements. He graduated from the University of Toronto in engineering and business. He is a master plumber, a master heating installer, and a master gas fitter. He is retired as owner and CEO of RG and Sun Limited Mechanical Contractors. His company is known to be one of the most advanced and valuable service companies in its sector. Most of us know Paul as an honorary life member of the RCYC, a singular honor. He has held many positions in the sailing world. He was a member of the International Olympic Committee, President of the International Sailing Federation, and President CEO for the Toronto 1996 Olympic bid. He has been a technical delegate for sailing in four Olympic Games, five Pan Am Games, and was the ISAF President for Sydney and Athens. His own sailing career has included being a member of the Canadian Olympic team for four Olympic Games. He was Canadian national champion seven times, USA national champion four times, and champion in Bermuda, Holland, and North America. And more recently, Paul placed third in the 2017 Shark Worlds. He has held various positions from president to member and founding member in various organizations, including the Toronto Racquet Club, Harbour Disabled Sailing Association, the Water Rat and Outer Harbour Sailing Federation. Paul was inducted into the Canadian Olympic Sports Hall of Fame in 2001 and the Ontario Sports Hall of Fame in 2019. This is a bio sketch. I have omitted many achievements. Please give Paul Henderson a warm show up. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try and be humble, Al. The, um, the Pope of Sailing, as you know, that's my nickname. How did I get it? Uh, in 1993, World Sailing, which is called now, was then called the International Yacht Racing Union, which is a better name in my opinion, and uh, uh, was going bankrupt. And uh, I blew the whistle, which as you know is one of my great things in life. And uh, so in 1994, they got rid of the old president and they elected me president. Uh, I got very few votes from Europe, but I got the rest of the world. And it happened at the Hilton Hotel in London, England. And I had to do a press conference afterwards. So I waited, that took about 45 minutes. I walked around into Shepherd's Market to a pub where some of my supporters were into it by that time. And there was a couple of kings there, the king of Norway and the king of, the king of Greece. And as I walked in, my old crew, Dennis Tate, stood up. He was an RCMP officer. He stood up and grabbed a microphone and he said, damn it, I wish he'd been elected Pope and then I'd only have to kiss his ring. <laughs> and after that, everybody in the world called me the Pope and I still get things today saying, hey Pope, how are you? Uh, how did it all start? Well, I grew up on Toronto Island. My father was a baseball player and we lived in a corner called Claps Cove. And Mr. Clapp, who was a member of the Queen City Yacht Club in 1942, saw a boat in Popper Mechanics called the Sabbath. And uh, so he conned 25 people on Toronto Island to buy these things for $50. And my dad bought one. But it was for my brother, who was uh, five years older, a foot taller, and built like the side of a barn but he was already sailing 14s. And so I'm eight years old, and my parents decided that I should sail. So every morning at 8.30, they put me down in the summer, they put me in the little boat, put a life jacket on, give me my lunch and say, try and be back for dinner. And I was eight years old today, you can't even go across the street, and they would send me off. So I grew up in Toronto Island over by, um, 
21 Third Street Ward says this works. Anyway, and what the most fun to do when you're eight years old is to sail your little Sabbath pram down the ship channel, which you know where the RCYC ferry boat is, and there was a lift bridge, and I'd come by in my little boat, and that guy would stop the traffic and ring the bells and up with the boat the thing, and I would sail through, and then 15 minutes later, I'd come back. Oh, boy. For an eight-year-old, what a wonderful time. Uh, there were two people who sailed the boats that time. There were a lot who sailed them, but two of them were interested. There was Mary Bonavia from India. She married Paul McLaughlin and produced the McLaughlins, the famous sailors, Terry and Frank. And then there was another man by the name of Gordon Reed. And Gordon Reed was a very tall man, but he couldn't have weighed over 150 pounds. <laughs> And he was, he retired, he was an engineer. He sailed with us a lot. I remember you liked dark chocolate, I don't know why. And uh, so he moved to Clearwater, Florida. And he figured out that if you took a Sabbath, which has a, a chine on it, and just made it out of two sheets of four by eight plywood, you can make a very simple boat for kids. He was a member of the Optimus Club. He gave the design to the Optimus Club in Clearwater, and sadly, a few years later, he died, and the Americans took credit for it, but it was Gordon Reed from the World Canadian Club. What? This man, we called him Tea Kettle Wade, because he worked for a Lipton Tea Company, in Connor of the Royal Canadian Club. And I guess when I was about 10, my parents allowed me to sail out the Eastern Gap on a Sunday afternoon. And I'm sailing out the Eastern Gap, and the great Patricia came by with his great stern wave, and I'm on my little Sabbath. And T.K. Wade leaned over, over and said, Mister, you're taking my wing. And that was my introduction. What happened then is, I most likely sailed 400 races against adults by the time I was 10 years old. So you had to get reasonably good. And my friend, uh, Dougie Clapp, who was one year older, uh, we, Mr. Mr. Clapp got us a membership in the Queen City Yacht Club for a dollar. And we represented the Royal Canadian Yacht Club in the Canadian Junior Championship. First at the Royal Hampton, where we finished second. And the next two years, we won. And this is the 1947 championship and if you look, this is 1947. Over here is Don Green, who just died. Ooh. Timmy Barber, yeah. Alfie Jenkins, Lou Pauly, Dougie Clapp, Dougie Hall, if you remember, some of you may remember him. And we were friends for over 70 years. We sailed against each other in the junior regatta. Don Green, as you know, Don Green had just died, won the Canada's Cup. And Timmy and Alfie were great, great members of this Shellbacks, and they were great friends of mine. Okay, this is the Cold Fleet. We, we won in 1948, and uh, then what happened? T. Kettle Wade and my father were Masons. And T. Kettle Wade convinced my father who came home in February and said, I just sold your rights to the Royal Canadian Yacht Club. I said, Dad, what the hell's that all about? I mean, I'm now 15, I guess. And he said, well, the next junior regatta is the Royal St. Lawrence Yacht Club and the Royal Canadian has to win. So you're now going to sail for the Royal Canadian. As you know, the Royal Canadian always wanted to beat the Royal St. Lawrence, uh, David. Anyway, the, uh, as I left to go to the regatta, the head instructor said, if you don't win, don't come back. And, and I've been here except for a few things uh, ever since. What happened here is we used to live in the annex at the RCYC. And uh, one year when Bobby Grant was Commodore, it was a very foggy, foggy day. And you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. It was very warm. 
and uh, the water was cold and it, it was due to a Mississippi, as I call it, Mississippi suck coming up with lots of uh, uh, moisture and it was very, very foggy. So they called off the uh, RCYC sail path. So we who lived in the annex, we decided to have our own sail pass and we put a big sign up saying the first annual now famous Royal Annex Yacht Club Regatta or a sail pass will be held as scheduled. Well, you know, the Royal Canadian Yacht Club, they thought it was terribly, terribly bad that we would call it the Royal Annex Yacht Club and have our sail pass. So Phil Bedroom said, um, I just got inducted into the uh, Imperial Pune Yacht Club, sailing six meters in Salonica, Corinthian. So we decided to call our annex the Imperial Pune Yacht Club. And what we used to do on the RCYC sail pass, we'd all sail past in our boats. And then we'd rent the John G. Langton Tug. We had it all dressed up with, we got, and these were our uniforms. And we'd all go back and go by the Commodore in the, in the thing. That guy, that's Bill Gooder. That's Billy Cox, who became a manager of our Olympic team. That's me playing the tuba. And, and what fun we had. Um, the reason they started the band was it was my job to win races. So they said, you know, weekend regattas. So they made it that I had to go to bed at 10 o'clock so that I'd be ready. So they could stay up and drink, but I had to go to bed in the end. So the band would march through the clubhouse, grab me, put down, put me in bed, and so I'd win the regatta the next day. Then what happened? In 1968, the, um, I got a call from Jack Jones, who was the head, the chief engineer at the uh, Harbor Commission. Terrific man. And he said, what you guys should do is go and start a, a sailing club out on the other harbor. He said, there's a little spit there, and you'll see this spit here. None of this was here when we started. It was just this little spit. You know what that spit's there for with the water wreck? That was Jack Jones' test to see, because everybody said, oh, well, you know, if you do this out here, it'll blow away. So he built this test pit and it grew. So he said, why don't you go down there and start a sailing club? So we did. And this was the first of the water. I mean, look behind those pictures and you see how desolate it was at that time. There were no trees, there was nothing there. And that's Gordy Norton and Billy Cox who always <coughs> the funny. Um, and uh, Billy Cox is the greatest organizer you ever, you ever saw. So this started the water rat, and this year is the 50th anniversary of the water rat. Paul, that's Peter Engholm's sunfish, apparently. Oh, that's Peter Engholm's sunfish. <laughs> uh, Peter, would you like to put up your hand so everybody knows who you are? So anyway. It was built by Barclay Livingston. <laughs> so what fun we had there, because we sailed all winter because the Hearn generating plant would pump out water, warm water, so we could sail all the time. And then what happened too, in about 1970, I got a call from Hans Folk, which are going down on a water rat in December because Montreal is frozen and Ian Bruce wants to bring his boat, new boat he's designed down there to test it out. And it was the laser. He called it TGIF then, but he changed the name from the laser. So the laser was sailed for the first time at the water end. And, uh, but it's the 50th anniversary. And this is what it looks like now. See all the trees? I went down there one day, and here was this funny man named Bill Cooper. <coughs> and he's planting willow trees. So it was Bill Gooder who planted all the trees that finally got us trees down in Granada uh, Harbor. Bill was great, uh, sailed with us a lot. 
So that was the water rent, and this is the 50th anniversary. There's another story, too, which I should tell you about the Outer Harbor Sailing Federation. I, in 1971, I was asked to give a speech with the community sailing programs. Community sailing programs have come out of St. Jamestown YMCA, and it got Moordale House, North Toronto YMCA, Westwood YMCA, and they were all on the Island Marina. And the Island Marina kicked them out, and they had no place to go. It happened to be the 1971 election, a federal election. The member of parliament <coughs> for that area was Donald McDonald, who just died. Donald McDonald's wife was a friend of my wife, and he was having a, a, a meeting of his inner sanctum on a Sunday morning, and I walked in and I got the greatest put down I've ever had in my life. I said, Don, what do you want me to do in the, elec in the election? He said, work for the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I said to Don, why don't you come next Wednesday because he was the minister, and this all this land out here where the water right is is federal land. And I said, stand up and promise the community sailing programs that if you get elected, we'll give that uh, you'll give the land. And so he did. And then he said, if there's anybody here from St. James Town, would you like to campaign for me? And he got 30 people to campaign. He won St. Jamestown by 600 votes, and he won the election by 400 votes. So, and Trudeau won the election by one. That's the original Trudeau. Anyway, and so, but Don did live by his word. He gave all that land to the Outer Harbor Sailing Federation. One club didn't take it up, and that was North Toronto YMCA. So there was a spot left. So Roger Wilson, decided to put the Hanlon Rowing Club there. Hanlon Rowing Club is really the upper Canada Rowing Club, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so then what happened, uh, we, we, Skip Lennox was my great crew, and we were sailing in, in Bermuda, and we did pretty well, and Paul Phelan uh, was rather impressed. He was, so I got a call, he said, would you like to come and have lunch with me? And I go down to the dock at the Yacht Club after lunch with Paul. And there's this brand new Flying Dutchman sitting there and he said, make the Olympic Games. And he gave me the vote. <laughs> and did that ever change my life? And if you think it isn't blowing there, it was blowing so hard, we had to put the cameraman on a, a RCYC dock. And people say, your sails left it. <laughs> First of all, that shows you you don't know a bloody thing about sailing dinghies. The flatter they are, the faster they go. So to, to you're pulling your sail, you'll be on your ear. Anyway, so Skip and I did go when we made the Olympic Games in, in Tokyo in 1964. And uh, Who's that Skip, guy besides Skip Lennox? He, he didn't have hair then either, if you notice. <laughs> Anything for speed. Okay, now I'm going to tell you a story, which at the time, you don't think how important it is. And it wasn't. I didn't think at the time. And I got a call from Stan Leibel. Stan Leibel was a member of the IYC. And he phoned me up and says, the RCYC has got the only crane, and I want to go to the Olympics, and I want to have a to launch my 5.5 meter. And I said, Stan, you cheap SOB, join the club. He said, I'm Jewish. I said, what the hell's that got to with you to do with sailing a sailboat? Well, he said, I'm Jewish at all. So I said, we're going to put you up for membership. So Billy Cox and Gordy Norton and I put Stan Leibel up for membership. As, as you have to understand, you don't need to take a tag day for Stan Leibel. It wasn't that we were putting him over a budget. <laughs> so anyway, he finds out that on the Monday, 
his name's going to come up for membership. So he phones me in the morning and he says, Paul, I would like to have lunch with you. He said, at a delicatessen on, on Spadina. I said, Switzers. He said, how do you know that? I said, we do the plumbing there. So anyway, <laughs> the, um, the go in, Stan drives up in a big Lincoln Continental, and he said, I haven't been honest with you. Not only am I Jewish, but I'm a practicing Jew. And I want you to withdraw my name. I said, Stanley, if they don't want you at my yacht club, I don't want to be a member. And that night, his name came up, and Bobby Grant, who was commoner, said, bloody well about time, Stan Lyle joined this club. Oh. <laughs> and this is, uh, there were three Lyles. Uh, there was Stan, who owned most of Markham. There was uh, his brother, who owned the Gibraltar Pant Company, where we used to go and get our stretch pants for going skiing, and was one of Canada's best squash players. And Alan's father, who was the number one diabetic research doctor in Canada. And so we also <coughs> inherited uh, Alan Lyman, who just won this brigade <laughs> a few weeks ago. And I remember Alan, I was on the Olympic team in uh, 1972, when there was the massacre of the Jewish uh, athletes. And so the IOC canceled the next day. And so we got a telephone call and I'm the coach, I'm the kindly old coach of the team. So as usual, I had to figure out what to do. Should we cancel the Olympics? Should we cancel all events that the Israeli uh, athletes are competing in? Or should we have a three day morning? I didn't know what the hell to do. So I looked out the window of the Olympic Hotel and there was Alan Leibel sitting at a, at a table all by himself. I went down and I said, Alan, what should we do? He said, we should be sailing today. If we don't sail, the terrorists win. And that became the policy of the IOC. And we did come start to compete the next day. Anyway, that's a little story about my friend Alan Lyman. Uh, terrible Ted Turk. I'm in uh, at the Goodwill Games in St. St. Petersburg, Russia. And Terrible Ted comes, I've got lots of stories to tell about Terrible Ted. Terrible Ted comes by with this little wee freckled faced woman. I don't know who the hell she was. <laughs> and, uh, and I see him walking through and I say, hey Terrible, how are you? He says, Curly, good to see you. <laughs> so this funny little woman walks up and she says, I know why he calls you Curly. Why do you call him Terrible? I said, I've known him a hell of a lot longer than you have. It was Jane Fonda. <laughs> anyway. And so Ted said, would you like to come to lunch? And I said, yeah. So he took me. We were going to City Hall in, in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And you know who the mayor of St. Petersburg, Russia, and there was 10 of us, three of us and seven Russians. It was put was the mayor of St. Peter, which was the first time I've done it. A terrible tent, and we sailing Flying Dutchman in 1967 in, uh, in Montreal. And two weeks later, terrible Ted phones me up and says, hey, Polly, uh, I got a real problem. Can you get me out of it? I said, terrible, I think I can. So I did. So he said, how am I going to pay you back? And I said, I have a little list. <laughs> so in 1980, we're trying to get $60,000 to buy the boats for our 1984 team, for Terry and Terry, Frank McLaughlin, and, and, and our woman 470 and our fin sailor. So Jimmy Crane decided we should have a $500 a plate dinner in 1980. So now we gotta get a speaker. <laughs> I said, I think I can get Ted Turner. I've got my little list here. So, so I phoned up his secretary, D, in uh, Atlanta. And I said, D, I'm a, I'm a sailor. Are you going to ask him to speak at a dinner? I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. He just, as you know, won the America's Cup. He just founded CNN. 
And uh, she said, he won't do it. He won't do any of that anymore. I said, Dee, I'm gonna send a, a letter. It's gonna be one line long. Would you put it on top of the pile? Said, dear Tara, I'm calling my marker from 1967. You'll speak at the Royal Canadian Yacht on one of these three nights in September. <laughs> Signed, Kirby. So, two weeks later, I got a telephone call. You really got something on a notion. I said, I sure do. <laughs> so I picked him up at the airport and I said, Terrible, uh, how are things going? He said, I'm going to be the next Rockefeller or have the ass out of my pants. So anyway, we went to the dinner and uh, he's a, a, a historian and a Civil War buff. He's always talked about the U.S. Civil War. He called his kids Brent and Beauregard, if you can believe it. Anyway, <laughs> So he goes through that, and then he starts talking about D-Day. Omaha Beach and Utah Beach and all that. But I put them at a table like this. And Bobby Grant, the commoner, her uncle, sitting at the table, and he waits for Turner to sh shoot his mouth off. And Bobby Grant leans back <laughs> in his chair and says, with all due respect, Mr. Turner, you're full of shit. <laughs> and Turner says, what do you know about it? He said, I was on the worst, I was in the first wave of tanks from the Fort Garry horse on shore on T Day. Turner said, I, de I defer to greater knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, anybody who doesn't know Ted Turner, or who doesn't like Ted Turner, doesn't know him. He's one of the most loyal. He'd be with the best people in the world. And if you'd sailed against him in the 60s, he'd leave them and go over and say hello. Great guy. Uh, so, I got invited to sail in some very interesting regattas. This is the NASA workboat regatta. And sailing there was Lowell North of North Sales, Ted Turner, Dink Schoonmaker, the, the uh, American uh, star champion, and me. And a man by the name of King Eric. King Eric had a disco in, uh, in Nassau. And we went out to dinner on Saturday night. And he was, needless to say, a man of color who had a haircut like me. <laughs> so I said, King Eric, if they put our heads together, we'd make a perfect ass. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, at the, at the presentation, 4,000 people on the park of work and King Eric is the MC. And we're up on a stage, fellas. And King Eric says, where's Henderson? Come for it. So I thought he was a bigger man. He put his arm around my shoulder and said, like this, and said, Henderson, if we put our heads together, we'd make the most unusual ass in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> that was King Eric. Anyway. <laughs> um, I got elected uh, world president, as I told you. Uh, and I was there from 94 to <coughs> 2005. Wow. And uh, the story is that I know five kings, they only know one plumber. What's more exclusive? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is uh, King Juan Carlos of Spain. The first meeting I went to uh, was in 1936, because Montreal got the Olympics, or when I was 36, in 1970. Because Montreal got the Olympics and Beppe Croce, who was then the president, who was an outstanding man, he was an Italian. He owned the El Splendido Hotel in Portofino and led the resistance against the fascists in the Second World War. And he went home for a nooner and came back and found out that his total cell had been shot by the fascists. And he was an outstanding guy. So I went to the first meeting because uh, Canadians didn't know that the class policy and organization committee was really the, the executive. And uh, Croce said to me, speak loudly, speak slowly, and use no English slang. And then he said, Paul, you're making a terrible mistake. And we were the guests of Juan Carlos and Franklin. And I said, well, what am I doing? Well, you're calling the king of Greece your royal highness. And he's your majesty. I said, that's all right. He's been calling me Peter all day long. <laughs> <laughs> King, 
King Juan Carlos is a good guy. Um, and uh, he, his son is now the king. And I'm sorry, ladies. But I, what happened was this. In 1992, it's the Olympics in Barcelona. And Crown Prince Philippe, now King Philippe, got picked for dope testing. And you have to pee in a bottle. So they contested. Nobody in Spain would go to see the crown prince pee in a bottle. So he said, come on, Henderson, you can come and watch me pee in a bottle. So I'm the only one to watch the king of Spain now pee in a bottle. So the thing was, then what happened is his, his sister is the Infanta Pilar. Infanta means princess in Spain. And she's a terrific woman. She was the head of equestrian. And one of the things you find by royalty is they never like to be alone. So we go for lunch, and I think we're in Prague. And she said, Henderson, come and sit down beside me. And let's have lunch. So I did. And the bill came. And I picked it up. She said, I invited you for lunch. I'll pay. I said, try and be a kept woman. And <laughs> to the princess. And she said, nobody ever said that to me before. <laughs> anyway, they're great people. There are, there are a lot of accomplishments that I'm proud of. One was the internet. In 1995, I got a call from the head of the Swiss Yachting Federation who worked for IBM. He was the head of IBM, Ferguson, head of IBM, not just a lonely guy like you. He was a top guy. So he said, you've got to get into the internet. I said, what the hell is that? So anyway, he convinced me. And so we went and we made a presentation to the board of World, uh, then the International Sailing Federation. And he, uh, they turned it down. So I had to pay $75,000 out of my own money to get sailing into the internet, and they never paid me back. But it's a good thing. The next thing is, there's something that I'm really proud of. When I took over, the first Olympics I was involved in was the Atlanta Olympics, which was in Savannah. Women's participation was 19%, the worst dual gender sport in the Olympics. By the time I left, Really, the last Olympics I had anything to do with, uh, where I could control it, was 2008. The women were already up to 45%. And if you think that was easy with the chauvinistic Europeans, you are nuts. And we had equal medals for men and women. And so I was very proud of doing that. Then we had colorful boats, and we went from bankruptcy to having $8 million in the bank. And they're now bankrupt again, in case you want. This is the Canadian Women's Olympic team in, in uh, Beijing with Jan Proben, uh, Katie Abbott, and Martha, my daughter. As I said, colorful boats. Whoa. This is what happens. The bloody Americans said, we, so we got these spinnakers. We thought it'd be great in Sydney Harbor to have all the boats with spinnakers with their country flags. The Americans said, well, we got three colors and the Finns have only got two, so they made us that they could only sail with white spinnakers. After the last race, unbeknownst to me, the sailors decided to parade down Sydney Harbor, and they put up their colorful spinnakers. The Finns won, the English were second, and the Americans were third. Okay, I had some axioms I learned. One is sailors look for the next shift in the wind. Rowers sit on their ass and look backwards. <laughs> That's a Mar Marty McBean statement. You know, Marty McBean won five medals, and we're at a political dinner, and we're sitting with, I don't know, the premier or whatever. And Marty gets up and says, politicians are like rowers. They sit on their ass and look backwards. <laughs> Paul, is that bad? <laughs> no. Um, and a thing which I think fits a lot of things in life, the difference between the good sailor and the bad is the good sailor can get his head out of his own book and look at the total race course. Sheila Cox, who I got to know because she was the Minister of Sport, said bureaucrats never say no, they just kill you with delay. What do you think about that one? And the smaller the boat, the better the sailor. 
And don't forget, especially true these days, the cold air comes from Canada, but the hot air comes from the United States. Bravo. <laughs> so they changed the rules in the International Olympic Committee, which was I could not become a member of the IOC because they didn't allow presence of federations to be, had to go through the National Olympic Committee. And after the Salt Lake City scandals, they, um, what they did is, is they nominated 15 of the 35 presidents to be on the IOC, and I was one of the first five, uh, because one of Tony Samaranch got to know me during the Olympic day. And the best thing I did was in 2005, I was on the evaluation commission to go to uh, judge the, the cities bidding for the, um, for the Olympic Games. So that was Madrid, Paris, London, New York, and Moscow. And people say, did you see the uh, picture of the queen? I said, why would I see the picture? I know her. Anyway, so over here is Sam Ramsamy, who's, who's South African, who started the anti-apartheid and sport movement, terrific person. The next one is uh, Nawal Matatuami from Morocco. Uh, she comes from a hill station in Morocco. She got an athletic scholarship to the University of Iowa. When she came, she only spoke her dialect from Iowa. She won a gold medal in the hurdles, the first, she's a little woman, I couldn't believe she did, and the first Muslim woman to ever win a gold medal in the Olympics. She now speaks five different languages and one of the brightest people I've ever met. So, um, oh, and a man of color behind, I'll tell you a story about him later. His name is Frankie Fredericks. Uh, what happened? Oh, pushed the wrong button. Uh, now we went to see Putin in Moscow, and we're standing outside seeing the Russian, the Russian army move by, and uh, it's February. I was smart, I took my long underwear, and Frankie Fredericks turned to me and said, Henderson, I'm so cold, I'm going white. I said, Frankie, go over there, they're having a party, get out of here. So, and they, the guy back here with the hair came down and sat beside me at lunch. And he said, you wanna hear my Barney House story? I said, uh, I looked at him, he had scarred him. I said, what's your name? He said, Slava Fetisov. <laughs> so he said, in, I'm 18 years old, I come from Siberia, and I speak no English, and I'm on the Russian hockey team, and we're playing the WHA in uh, Hartford. He says, I go up in the first uh, period, and there's this guy over in the corner who's blinking, really old, so I decide to go and get the puck up. He said, the next thing I knew, it was the second period. I had run into Gordy's house elbows. <laughs> So he goes out in the second period, and he said, I had the best hip check in any in hockey, and I laid Gordy Howe out. And his two sons were playing for Hartford. It started the world famous 45 minute bench clearing brawl with Hartford against, against the Russians. So finally, he gets to be 29, and he's allowed out of Russia, and he goes to New Jersey, and then he gets traded to Detroit when he's 39. And he's sitting in the Detroit Red Wings um, locker room and in comes Gordy Howe. Gordy Howe goes up to him and says, nice hip check, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Fetisov. So then, then we went to New York and uh, they could take us out to dinner. New York spent uh, $4 million on 10 of us in four days. So, they were allowed to take us out one night, and so we started off at the uh, at the Lincoln Jazz Center, and uh, the first person up was Mayor Bloomberg, and then uh, Nadia Comedies got up and introduced some uh, ballet star that had a physique like we all wish we had, and then uh, uh, Rupi Goldberg got up and gave a really funny speech and introduced Winston Marcellus, 
And then uh, Barbara Walters got up and introduced some movies from, and then Meryl Streep got up and and introduced Broadway stars, saying, yeah, well, we thought it was still Broadway, but with that, the screen came down and we're looking down Broadway. And they put all our, sign, all our names up on Broadway. Welcome, Polly the plumber, it said. So anyway, <laughs> uh, so we go back to dinner, and Jay Cross, some of you know Jay, as we're walking in, and we're at Bloomberg's house, not Gracie Mansion, up on the third floor. And uh, Jay walks in and said, what a terrible seating arrangement. And there was Kofi Annan, Henry Kissinger, Vera Wang, I didn't even know who she was. Matt Damon had no idea who he was. And who was my date for two and a half hours? Meryl Street. <laughs> On the other side, I'm terribly sorry, I had a Southern Baptist minister for, so for two and a half hours, I sat talking to Meryl Street. And at the, end, at the end of the deal, in a room no bigger than this, in walked three people. One was playing the drums, one played the bass, and the other strumming the guitar, singing Hello, Mr. Robinson, that was Paul Simon. What a night. <laughs> okay. Okay, World Sam. I've been rather nice. I'm now going to be typical Paul Harrison. <laughs> okay. In my opinion, competitive sailing is based on sailing clubs, international classes, and regatta weeks. Metal races, which is the thing they've done, is that five days, five day regatta, after the fourth day, only the top 10 are allowed to go race the last day. So everybody goes home. And I think it was bet put by Ted Turner when we were sailing fins in Alameda's Bay, California, with about 90 entries. It was hotter than hell, and Dean Schoonmaker said, they're only giving prizes for the top five. Henderson, where did you finish? I said, ninth. Why don't we go to a restaurant, just as we was, instead of going back for a rubber chicken dinner at the Yacht Club? Ted Turner said, I'm going to the banquet. Somebody's got to cheer. And this is one of the problems, in my opinion. Okay, the, the people who have now taken over world sailing have a new model called sport, nature, and technology. I believe in competitive sailing, clean air, clean water, and talent, not technology. World sailing has jumped on the latest gimmick, corporate governance. <laughs> Anybody who knows about this yacht club knows what I think about that. But anyway, <laughs> and, and, and what is it about? It's so nobody takes personal responsibility for anything. So anyway, what's happened now? From Rio 2016 to 2024, eight of the Olympic classes will be changed. Why? Follow the money. And here's what's going to happen. And I must admit that both the United States Yachting Association and Canadian, we're now called Sail Canada, supported Three, beat, three classes out of the 10 that are off the beach. Why? Why do they put, well, you don't, need a, you don't need a club. You don't need a sailing club. I'm sorry, they're funded by Yacht Club. So the first thing is the men's windsurfer, which has been in since 1998. It's a new mono monopoly equipment. There's no class association. It's going to be foiling slack. <laughs> Never been raced in before. So the women's the same. The men's one person dinghy, they're totally gonna to replace the laser. The most popular boat in the whole world. They don't know what the equipment is, but that's the way it is. Same thing with the women's one person dinghy. The mixed two person dinghy is a 470. They're going to get rid of a men's 470 and a women's 470 and put a mixed 470 in, which has never been raced in before. I wonder what's going to happen with the transgenders. Anyway, then the women's skiff, which are, is a monopic class owned by Bethway, just been in for a while. Uh, men's skiff, the same thing. Then they got the mixed two-person NACRA foil. It can't even race in winds over 16 knots. And I'll get into that. And then 
they're talking about a, a mixed two-person keelboat offshore. First of all, no Muslim country in the world will allow this to happen. They will not allow women and men to sail together overnight. The equipment is $250,000 each, and you've got to buy training boats. And they're kicking the fin at the most popular community in the world for people over 80 kilos. So then they're going to mix kites. Uh, a mixed relay race. You got that? They're going to have a mixed relay. Never been raced in before. In my opinion, kites are not sailing. What happens when the wind drops? They have to be rescued. And in Korea, where they were having a Asian championship, the rescue boats couldn't do anything because they got caught up in everything and just cut a kid's leg off. And, and it's a separate federation. They're now going into snow kite boarding, <laughs> land kite. And why are they putting it in the Olympics? It's called money. Richard Branson of Virgin Airlines bought the World Kite Surfing Tour. And you got to realize that this is mixed relay race. I know, now will you women please cover your eyes because I know how sensitive you all are. But here is from Richard Branson's uh, internet page of what he believes mixed quite kite board sailing is going to be. <laughs> Isn't this a great Olympic sport? And, back from the Greek tradition. and he is the money behind kite surfing. The America's Cup. I might as well wake up on that. The America's Cup. In 2007 in Valencia, I was the chairman of the board of the Italian Plus 39 entry, which was funded by the Mafia, so you know why I was there. Anyway. Look at this, 12 entries. There was a million people walking on the shore. It was the most spectacular event ever. Now what are they going for? Foiling. Look at this. Here's another, this is the, the US boat. You know who's designing the US boat? Air Labs are one of their sponsors. This is being uh, designed by aeronautical engineers, some yacht designers are totally out. And you know what? Do you know how many entries they have? Four. Because nobody wants it. It isn't sailing. So, what sells? In my opinion, heroes and nationalism sells. And if you want to know about that, all you had to do was watch the Masters Golf this weekend. Tiger Woods, nobody cares what golf club he's using or what ball he's hitting. He's the hero, and the ratings went through the roof. They've never, ever been for anything like when Tiger was there. So this is a star book. So then they have a regatta just last week in Palma. They kicked the star out of the Olympics. Only three classes could sail over at 18 knots. All the other classes that they think should be in the Olympics can't sail over 18 knots. So they only the star class, the fin. Isn't that a great picture? <laughs> and the men and women, 470. They were the only ones who could sail. All the rest had to stay on the shore because it was blowing too hard. If you can't sail over 18 knots, wind, you shouldn't be sailing. In Masters, in Athens in 2018, there were 400 entries. And that's guys over the age of 15. That's me. Anyway, uh, if you have any questions, I'm quite prepared to answer them. Thank you, Paul. Bravo! Any questions or comments?
Is Meryl uh, Steve? Before you ask a question, would you please tell me who you are? I'm Ron Greener. Oh, I know who you are. Yes. Okay. Uh, is Meryl Streep into sailing? I know she no. sings. But I tell you, is she bright? If you wanted to meet a bright woman, it was Meryl Streep. Yeah, yeah. And people say, what did you talk to her for two and a half hours? That's the only thing I could think of. And she said a very interesting thing. This was, it was 2005. She said, I've given up four leading roles in Hollywood because my children need me more than, I, than they do. And she said, my kids are 14 and 16. And so, but I, she's an exceptionally bright person. An exceptionally bright person. So Al Ray. So she's not able to it, so. Paul, um, many here may know, but most don't, that you and I go back a long way. I've known you since I was probably nine years old, ten years old, sitting in the Cove Fleet. And you and I have always had a wonderful adversarial friendship. But the more I get to know you and the more I get to know what you've done for sailing in this country and in the world, my hat goes off to you. I just, it's a privilege to know you and it's a privilege to be part a little bit of the background from which you sprang to continue the world. Thank you so much. Nice things about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to change and say nice things about you too. <laughs> Are there any more questions or comments, Ron? Yeah, uh, I've uh, I've been watching the provincial government dealing with Ontario Place lately, and um, I think you probably know the break wall there has three ships that. Uh, that are there. Um, one of them was called the Victorious, and I believe the bridge of the Victorious became the clubhouse of the water rats. And I'm just wondering if you could tell us how that yeah, happened. Yeah, what happened is Jack Jones, um, I mean, we had no money. I, I gotta tell you a little story about that. We started up the water rat, and uh, we needed $10,000 uh, to build a fence, you know, and, and do the things. So. The manager of the RCYC was Colonel Evans at that time, so Cox and I came down and conned the Colonel into allowing us to, to look, at, look at the club membership, and we sent out 125 letters asking for $100. 100 people at the RCYC sent us $100. So we got the $10,000. And uh, <laughs> so then Jack Jones said that we're scrapping the Victorious. Why don't you uh, get them to cut off the, 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 the top of it and use it as your clubhouse? And that's what we did. But then another better story was you got to understand the water rent was funded and organized and put together by members of the Royal Canadian Opera. At a city council meeting, I think his name, what's that guy's name? I'm trying to forget it because he was such a pain in the after porthole. Jack Lee got up and said, the type of clubs we need are the water rep, not the Royal Canadian Yacht Club. So I phoned him and said, uh, Jack, just with all due respect, <laughs> the Royal Canadian Yacht Club funded the water rep. So the first year I moved the fence, and the second year I moved it a little bit farther, and the third year I moved it right up to the road. Jack Jones phoned and said, you must never move that fence again. I said, Jack, we put it up to the road. We don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> so that the victorious was the. Okay, now that I've bored you. <laughs> no, you haven't at all. In fact, I echo what Alan Ray said. I haven't known you as long, Paul, but you have done so much for the sailing world. So thank you for that today. And a little token of our appreciation. One more thing. <laughs> because of this. You see that? That's the Olympic order. They give it to you when they think they're getting rid of you. <laughs> so in 93, they thought they were getting rid of me. So they gave me one, but I got elected the next year. And I am the only one in history that has two of them. 
because when it got to 2005, they forgot they gave me the original one, and now I have two. So I asked them, could I trade two silver for a gold, and they told me to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, one question, Paul. You have a history, and I've been decades, of fixing things. Why don't you fix the RCYC? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I, I hope we can. It's uh, uh, the Roque Akam in some ways suffers by its name. To me, it's really the Toronto Sailing Club, and it's a members' activity club, and that's what our sport is. We've got to remember that our sport is a participatory sport, and that's what we do. We do it because we love it, and we make friends, and clubs should be a place, in my, play, in my opinion, where you hide from the real world. And the real world's getting worse. So if you have clubs, come and hide from the real world. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Oh, Jim has a question. Your, uh, predict your comment about where the Olympics is going in sailing, do you ever think this high technology will get reversed back to basics? Oh, God, would you pray for that, please? <laughs> I mean, if, if you've got a direct pipeline, would you please pray? But you're the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it's technology, it's just nonsense. I mean, I look, you mentioned that I sailed in the shark. And I bought a shark in a farmer's field for $2,500. It had a, in Beijing. It had a trailer and a motor. I took it to John Finch and he fared the queue. I sailed with my daughter and her boyfriend with 50 boats and we finished third in the world. How can you, for, and it cost me, when I put it all together, less than $8,000. How could you have a better fleet than the simple shark fleet? And that's what I believe sailing is. Sailing is talent. It's David used to sail the worst old 14 foot dinghy you ever saw, and he'd go out in Toronto Bay and do bloody well. So yeah, I, I just believe we gotta get away from this technology stuff. We have to go back to the mm -hmm. And I would echo that. Thank you, Paul. It's been a delight to have you here today. And you've really uh, finished off our season wonderfully well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, before we, little before thing. we finish completely, <laughs> on behalf of, I think, all the participants here today, uh, as opposed to Paul's competitors, since we aren't competing at this point, we're participating, um, I think I would like to, on behalf of all of us, thank Diane, thank you, thank Elspeth, for all the work you've done this year, so and, we could participate and in Ron, this, and, and you can and name Ray. all the rest of the people that are here that have done stuff that we have all benefited from and enjoyed for the year. Thank you very much to all of you. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, somebody asked me, how do I find all the speakers? Well, they often come to me now, and often I get them through recommendations from you. So I thank you for that. We are full for September, or October through December. And so I'm looking for speakers for January through April, and I even have a couple in there already. So I thank you as audience for that. I also thank the staff here at uh, RCYC. You have absolutely been wonderful, and the chef as well. And I'd also like to thank Elspeth for our little treats today for Easter. So we could give her a round of applause here as well. And uh, upcoming, we've got our Peterborough Canoe Museum excursion. And again, I remind you, if you're interested, you give me a call. Our first meeting in the fall is October the 16th, and we have Richard Mitchell, known as D. He was nominated as the 2016 Canadian Sailor of the Year. He will share with us an inspirational adventure of a life. He is um, a, a quadruple.
quadriplegic. He has vast experiences as a disabled person and a sailor. And he came along as a result of our having Martha here talking about uh, the disabled sailors. So I wish you all an amazing summer. If you're joining us for June, I look forward to seeing you. And with that, pipes heavy. Thank you.